Um, so, hi. <laughs> Sorry we're getting off to a little bit of a late start, but um, partly it's just, as you know, because the other panel didn't vacate right away. Um, I imagine that you guys are all here um, in the room because you already know who Raina Telgemeier is, and so I'm gonna keep the introduction very brief. But if by chance you have not heard that she has a brand new book debuting at SPX called Sisters, you should make sure that you uh, find a place to buy it before you go, or at least take a look at it. Um, Raina is the author of a couple of uh, New York Times best-selling comics, uh, Smile, which is autobiographical, and drama, which I take to be mostly fiction, mostly. fiction derived from life. Yeah. And, um, and we'll be talking a little bit about those things and about how, how, her, how she got to where she is as a cartoonist. Um, it, it, it's even possible that there may be some spontaneous drawing if we can find a big enough piece of paper. There's a guy off looking for it right now. Cross your fingers, maybe it'll happen. Um, I forgot to say who I am. It's not very important, but my name is Isaac Cates, and if you're into comics for kids, come by my table too. I'm upstairs, and I have a cool fantasy anthology that you might like. What's it called? It's called Cartosia Tales, yeah. and it's, uh, it's, it's good. <laughs> I can say that because I'm, I'm, I'm really I'm the editor-publisher. I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, <laughs> it's not all my stuff, and I feel really proud of it, but um, you're not here to hear me talk about that. You're here to hear Raina talk about her stuff, and I know she's going to give a brief uh, talk, and then she and I will have a short conversation, and then maybe there will be some drawing, and if not, at any rate, toward the end of the hour, we'll have some time for, um, for your questions. Okay? So go ahead, Raina. Thank you, Isaac. Hey, guys. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Um, so if you saw me at the National Book Festival, I apologize in advance because what you're about to see is a truncated version of the same presentation I gave there. Um, I came here today thinking that I was gonna draw pictures for you guys, and as mentioned, the paper is not here. So I was like, well, I've got a thumb drive in my pocket and I might as well show you guys some slides. Um, and what I'll just briefly talk about today is where sisters came from, because when you write a book, the first question you get asked is, what inspired you to write that book? What was the inspiration behind this book? Um, and for me, the inspiration for Sisters starts with a book called Smile, which was published in 2010. And Smile was the true story of my orthodontic exploits during my middle school years. I had a terrible accident where I tripped, fell, and knocked out my two front permanent teeth when I was 11 years old, and then had to spend four and a half years getting things kind of taken care of. So that is, I guess you could say, the framing device for the story of Smile. Um, it's about teeth, but it's also about my adolescence. It's about growing up, it's about figuring out who I was and becoming an artist, and uh, using those tools to sort of get past the experience of being toothless. And also, good dentistry played a role in that, too. Um, and then there's this picture of me and my sister, which I like to show people pictures of my life from these days, because people are like, is that really true? Or, or is your name really Raina? Did you really? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, here's pictures to prove that I am me. Um, and as you can see from this photograph, I'm the older one. I really liked to draw when I was a kid. That's some of my artwork on the, the back of the room. And my little sister, um, she's also an artist. And that's really the only thing that we have in common. Um, and there's one panel in Smile where I talk about a road trip that my family took when I was 14. And this is the only reference to that road trip that you actually see in Smile. So um, it's like, we took a road trip. And then I move on from there and talk about high school. And then I realized that um, these pictures of my sister and I were kind of inspiring. And that road trip was actually kind of a crazy road trip. So I decided to focus on those two aspects in Sisters. So it's about a road trip, the way that Smile is about my teeth, in that it's sort of like a way to talk about this time in my life, which was kind of a confusing time. Between middle school and high school, my family was not um, in a great place in those years. So we sort of find out about my parents' marriage and a lot of really fun stuff like that. Um, but the road trip was fun and exciting, including things like bad weather and lots of mosquito bites. Um, and our destination was Colorado, which is where my cousins lived at the time, and we were going to a family reunion. And I was really excited to see my cousins because I was like, well, my sister doesn't like me very much, but I have this cousin who's kind of the same age as me, and I was like best friends with her when I was little. I can't wait to see her again. But when I got to Colorado, I realized she was like way more mature than I was and just wanted to sit around and sing karaoke all night which, you know, that could be fun, but I was very bored. 
Um, there are flashback sequences and sisters to my relationship with Amara from the time she was a baby. Um, I was really excited to get a little sister, but when I did, I was like, wait, babies are boring and they're really noisy and stinky and stuff. So I was like, what? <laughs> this isn't what I was expecting at all. Um, but as she grew up, there, there were things that we had a little bit more in common, like uh, our pets, many of whom died in really unusual ways. Um, and yeah, fish go to the bathroom, you, you know, we had to learn about that somehow. <sighs> and I really hate snakes, and my sister really loves snakes, and she wanted a pet snake for the longest time. And the reason I hate snakes so much is because um, when I was four, I was walking through a blackberry patch once in a forest, and I stepped on a dead snake, and it, like, wiggled. <laughs> it was really disgusting. Um, and I ran out of the patch and got scratched up by blackberry stickers and things. And so I'm like, I hate snakes. I never want a snake, and my sister had other ideas. And so all of these um, things converge to the climax of sisters. The road trip, the pets, the snake story, they all come together at the end in very exciting ways. So just very quickly, sorry that my R is the same size as my P here. This is what happens when you don't have your own computer. Just very briefly, the process of making graphic novels, because it's kind of a mystery to people that don't make them, how they go from being ideas in your head to something in a beautiful book like they are. Uh, these are my tools. There's nothing mysterious about it. I use Bristol board to draw on. I use a uh, gridded plastic ruler to make my panel borders and stuff. And the way that I write is in a format called thumbnails. And thumbnails just mean like rough draft versions of every page. So I'll do the entire page where I'm laying out the panels, putting in stick figures, and having each stick figure have a word balloon coming out of their mouth. And I do my entire book like this. So I do 200 pages of thumbnails and then send those to my editor. And my, edit, my editor edits from this stage. And it's a lot easier to edit at a rough draft stage if your editor says like, you know what, this 50 page sequence should probably get scrapped. If I haven't gone to full artwork yet, that's a little bit easier on my soul and my wrist. So uh, once the thumbnails are taken care of, the next stage is pencils. This is where the Bristol board comes in. I'm now working on heavier, thicker paper. Um, I'm drawing things to suit just the way I see them in my head. I'm just gonna go very quickly back to the thumbnail versus the pencil. I try to keep the energy of the thumbnail and the pencils. Um, and then I ink, and I'm doing everything traditionally up to this point. I'm using paper and pencils and ink and brushes, um, and that's because Jeff Smith uses a brush, and when I was in college, somebody was like, you know, if you want your comics to be better, you should use a brush like Jeff Smith. And boy, they were right. Brushes are great. And now I scan everything into a computer, and now it enters the digital world, which just means that the color and the letters are gonna be applied on a computer. And I don't do either of those stages myself. Um, I work with a letterer and a colorist on my books. When everything comes back to me, it looks like this, and that's when I go, wow, cool. It's like I'm seeing my work for the first time at this stage, too. So it's still like a magical thing that happens. Um, and so that's Sisters. And I'm going to leave this slide up here on the screen, um, and then we're going to chat. Right? Sounds so good. now I'm going to sit in a chair. <laughs> <laughs> Although, we all sit over there, because oh. there's a little bit better visibility. Yes. Yeah. Everyone wants to look at me, right? Yeah, they want to be able to see you. They're all there. They're all, they're all well, no. I'm still missing them. They just look nice now because right. dentistry. <laughs> um, so I, I, I had wanted to ask you um, some about, I guess, <clears throat> a question about how you got about, I guess, like preliminary things before the books that we've seen. I wanted to kind of ask like how, how they came into existence, but also kind of, I mean, from reading the autobiographical books, you get a sense that like the young Reina is really interested in drawing, mm -hmm. but you, I, there's nothing yet in them about learning to draw comics or, um, or like how you go from sitting at your desk and doodling to making comics and then turning the turning turning out to make a comic that's a couple hundred pages long. So I was wondering if you could, like, kind of talk a little bit through your apprenticeship. Yeah, and definitely. And like kind of get us up to the point where you're drawing Smile. Okay, so. I started reading comics when I was nine, and it was the newspaper funnies that I gravitated towards. So it was Calvin and Hobbes, and For Better or For Worse, and Foxtrot, and Luann, and Dennis the Menace. And I fell in love with comics immediately. Up to that point, I was an illustrator. I, w I thought I wanted to be an animator. I made a flip book when I was in third grade, and it had seven pages, and it was really underwhelming, because I was like, I brought it to show and tell, and was like, look, and it was over in like a split second. And everybody was like, yeah, so. And I was like, oh man, all right. So comics, when I found them, I was like, this is perfect. It's still sequential. 
art, and it's still storytelling, but it's a little bit more controlled. And I like being a one-woman uh, studio. I like to not have to rely on voice actors and directors and stuff. So mm -hmm. comics are something that you can just do by yourself. Um, I'm a control freak and I'm a loner, so those that's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, and by loner, I just mean like I like spending time in my studio. So um, I made my first comics when I was 11 in sixth grade. I was trying to like draw stuff for the school paper and stuff, and none of them really made people laugh. So I kind of gave up on showing my comics to people for about 10 years. But I continued drawing them for myself. And what I would do is every day after school, instead of writing in like a diary, I would go home and write a comic about my day. So I have um, a record of sixth grade through the end of college. So you were like James Kachalka before James Kachalka. I did invent the diary comic, totally. No, that's wow. not true. Um, but I wasn't, I wasn't showing them to anybody because it was my diary. It was really embarrassing <laughs> stuff. No one would show anybody that. Um, and then when I was a about 20, I finally realized I need to start doing things that other people can look at. So I started making mini comics and started going to shows like this one, Small Press Expo. Um, and I was a student at the School of Visual Arts, which is an arts college in New York, um, SVA for short. And they have a cartooning department there. So I was able to like take classes with cartooning teachers. And it was really just like a great time in my life. I was meeting a lot of other cartoonists. I was tabling at shows and I was making mini comics. Ooh. Could've don't mind the man behind me. Don't mind me. <laughs> it's all, all this technology. Don't, don't pay attention to the man behind um, me. Here. So the mini comics I made in college, a lot of them were stories about my life, and some of them were stories about my childhood. And the more I took them to shows like this one, the more when people asked me, is this okay for my kid to read because I like your friendly style, I was like, eh, this one is, but don't read number four because that one's about, you know, adult stuff. Nothing scandalous, but just, you know, about me as an adult, and I didn't think kids would be interested. But I liked being able to give parents something that their kids could read with them. So I sort of started focusing my mini comics on the childhood stories, and that's about when I met up with Scholastic, and they were looking to work with graphic novelists for their graphics imprint. In 2005, they started publishing Jeff Smith's Bone as color graphic novels, and it was in 2005 that they were like, hey, we need other people to work with. Oh, we like your mini comics, Raina. You should come and work for us. But at that point, the longest story I had ever drawn was eight pages long, and graphic novels are longer than that. <laughs> so they were like, what did you like to read when you were a kid? And I mentioned I had been a Babysitter's Club fan, and that is Scholastic's property. So they were like, what if you did an adaptation? So I adapted and illustrated four graphic novels of the Babysitter's Club, which was one of my favorite series when I was growing up. And um, that sort of opened the doors for me. It gave me the confidence to be able to write and draw long form stories. And Smile was a story that I was just publishing on the internet. It's like one page a week, it's about my life. Yeah, no one will read this. But when I was done with Babysitter's Club, Scholastic asked what else I had. I had Smile, at that point I had drawn 120 pages. Finished the story, they colored it, they published it, and the rest is kind of history. That's, I mean, that's a long history, my goodness. I'm <laughs> sorry to put you guys no, all to a, sleep I mean, with my origin story. It, it's, it's interesting <laughs> to me because of the, I mean, t a couple of things to, to, that are interesting to me about it are like, well, the, the moment at which you, uh, the moment at which SPX starts to be useful to you, or shows like SPX, SPX and MoCA and shows like that, mm -hmm. they start to be useful. Um, really long before any of the stuff that we Definitely. can now see, you yeah. know, and they're, they're like part of your training almost. You know, there, there are people, uh, there will be people on the floor upstairs who are sort of at that moment where they have one or two things that they've drawn in Xerox. I'm so sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I know this is really distracting, <laughs> but like one of the things you guys in the audience can do uh, this weekend is like go try to find those people who, you know, have, have drawn one or two things. Or you can be those people. Or you can be those people, right. There's it's also no barrier for entry to make comics, especially mini comics. All you have to do is find a Xerox <laughs> machine and obviously make some comics, but then you Xerox them and fold them and staple them and then you're in business. Yeah, the real, the real alchemy is just having a lot of time at your desk yeah. where all you're doing is making that thing. That's where the loner aspect comes right. into play. <laughs> It was yeah. interesting. You mentioned being a what you, you said a control freak and loner, but you were also involved in theater, right? When you were in high school, like when you were I was in, the in middle school and high school, yeah, but yeah. not any professional theater, just right. like school just theater. School theater, yeah. But I, I, it, it seems to me like that's a, like that's a kind of fundamentally collaborative art. And that's true. I mean, maybe <laughs> the answer to the question I'm about to ask is just that you don't do it anymore. But do you <laughs> see, 
do you see ways that what you learned in doing middle school and high school theater are like helpful for you in cartooning? Because they, <laughs> theater requires a lot of people in order for a show to go off. It does. And you were saying a car being a cartoonist only requires you to be at your desk. I had a lot of stage fright when I was young and I had to take a choir class as an elective in middle school. And that sort of made me realize that I could open my mouth in front of people and that could be okay. And then theater was just something that, I don't know, I, I really gravitate towards the electricity of theater and sort of that, that feeling that you get when you're collaborating with other people, but because you're following a script and you have stage directions and stuff, it's all sort of controlled. Um, I guess I like controlled chaos. Maybe that's a better way of putting it. But um, definitely being in front of people all those times kind of helped me with what I do now, which a lot of it does involve getting on stage like this and speaking. <laughs> I have no stage fright anymore. <laughs> and, and also, I mean, it seems to me like um, there are things you learn from acting or watching actors that turn out to be useful when you're yeah. drawing. Like, it, you know, what gesture are you going to make in order to communicate this idea, or how can you give this character body language that's different from the body language of another character? Those are sort of the things you learn in theater. Cartooning is totally acting. It's yeah. true, and it's, it's, it's acting in a much more quiet and personal way, but... Studying people on film and on stage and just in life, I think, is really important. Um, do you want to talk a little more about uh, those influences you were listing as like uh, the newspaper comics and things you learned from them? Like you said Calvin and Hobbes and For Better, For Worse and mm -hmm. Foxtrot. Um, I mean, it occurs to me those are really great examples of cartooning and comics, but also they might not be so useful when you start thinking about long form storytelling. Like a, newsp a daily strip has a sort of built in rhythm that's not the rhythm even of a full page of, of a comic, of a graphic that's novel. True. And then if you're drawing something that's several hundred pages long, uh, like, do you, how do you navigate like what you learned from newspaper comics <laughs> and how do you bring it into? Well, there was the daily reading of the comics, but then my dad would buy me the collected volumes. And so it was cool to see how like a four week storyline would play out when you were reading one page after the next as opposed to having to wait a day between each installment. So it's kind of like watching a DVD of your favorite TV show where you can sit down and watch a whole season of something in one sitting versus watching an episode of something. And I think that those rhythms are, are important to build into comics. And because Smile started out as a web comic that I was only posting one page per week, it does have kind of a beat per page uh -huh. format, whether people are aware of it or not. There is sort of like a funny thing that happens or like a, a thing someone says with a certain Right, each page of. has to be a thing. Yeah, it each page is a thing. It can only be a setup for the next page right. because it's, yeah. Yeah, so, so I think that sort of made its way into my work. Um, and, you know, when I was a little bit older, I started getting into indie comics and started getting into graphic novels and stuff. So yeah. I... I didn't know I wanted to be a graphic novelist until somebody said, hey, why don't you make graphic novels for us? So that was, that was like, oh, that sounds like a good idea. I'll try that. And it just really ended up working out for me. And now I sort of can't imagine doing anything else, at least not at the moment. Um, who, like, who, who do you think of as your, like, who do you aspire to work more like? I, I'm, this is maybe a question not just about influences, but still, like, are there people whose work you read and you think, oh, I wish I could do that, that like, make, I wish my work were more like that person? Oh, like, or don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking the question kind of <laughs> just to help people in the audience who are fans of yours build a reading list of peripheral stuff. Like right. Who, who, you know, who are you reading and would put on their, their list of, like, yeah. oh, this is somebody, like, if if you haven't read Jeff Smith's Bone, like you would wanna go get that. And that's you know? a pretty big one. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of people that are my contemporaries that I look at and say, I love what this person's doing. Since we're getting into recommended reads, um, there's a book that just came out called El Defo. It's by Cece Bell, who has been a children's book illustrator for quite some time. And she has just released a graphic novel that's about her experience with having to wear hearing aids when she was growing up because she lost her hearing when she was four. And it's just, it's the story of her childhood, and it's the story of her, you know, needing to find friends and having something a little bit different about her and wanting to feel normal, and there's a lot of themes that overlap with Smile, and it's a fantastic book, and it's really, the artwork is really inviting and beautiful to look at, and it's kid-friendly, so it's like, ages eight and up will like it. Um, 
And then, I mean, Linda Berry is a guest here. And if you haven't read Linda Berry's work, she is such a huge influence on me. I discovered her when I was 13. Yeah, you mentioned her in, uh, in Sisters. There's a yeah. panel where you're <laughs> sitting in a car reading Linda Berry. Linda Berry's comics, yeah. She was my YA. That's what I tell people. Because YA didn't really exist when I was a kid. There weren't like books that were directed at 13 to 18. And now it's like a huge part of the book market. But Linda Berry was writing comics for that age group when I needed them the most. And her, her life and her stories are way more messed up than my life was, but it was like, oh, okay, so perspective. My life isn't really that bad compared to this. Um, <laughs> and that makes it sound like they're really terrible, but they're really well-written and they're really introspective. They're really, and they're really fun. They're too. really <clears throat> interesting, yeah. yeah. They, she's, she's got a better sense of voice than just about any other writer I've ever encountered, and I love her. And I think there's something kind of wonderful about, <clears throat> about Linda Berry's cartooning in that it, it will give you the sense that you also can draw comics because <laughs> there's, I mean, it's, it's really she in the good room? cartooning, but it's not, it's ugly. it doesn't look sophisticated. Yeah. It doesn't look like something you couldn't do. And yet there's, you know? there's I mean, I, it's true that you can't. If you look at them, you would, <laughs> you would not actually be able to do what she's doing. No. But it doesn't look on the surface like something you couldn't do. It and looks so it's like it was drawn by an eight-year-old sometimes. Yeah. It's got a really um, sort of youthful quality to it. And that it, I think that's actually really motivating or inspiring mm -hmm. that like you can read it and think okay this is something I want to do yeah I also really like Brian Lee O'Malley's work that's kind of the other end of the spectrum he did the Scott Pilgrim series he just released a comic called seconds his work um, skews a little bit older than mine well a lot older than mine but I still like look at his artwork and I'm just like that man that ah, ah. that's that's my response to reading his work so that's how you know it's really good <laughs> 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 Um, there was one, there was a couple other things I wanted to ask you about, uh, particularly about the autobiographical comics, although I think drama figures in one of the questions too. But in, when you're writing autobiography, how important is it for you for everything in the book to be factually mm. exactly as it happened? <laughs> like, do you, do you change things around in order to make the story work, or do you feel like it's got to be the true thing, even if that doesn't work for the story? So, <laughs> Smile's about 99% true. The only thing that's different is the timeline is a little compressed because it has to be for the sake of writing a contained story. Mm -hmm. And some of the characters have different names than the real people that they're based on. And in a couple of cases, I would combine identities. So it would be like one girl's image with another girl's personality, but not very far from what it originally was in my life. Um, and then Sisters, I say, is about 95% true because those are memories that are a little bit foggier for me for mm. whatever reason. So I had to do like more writing and I had to pick and choose more which pieces of the story I wanted to tell and put together. So um, there were a couple of things that I had to sort of just slightly adjust just so that it worked as a whole narrative. Um, but yeah, drama is the least true of my stories, but I think it's still emotionally true. And for me, that's the most important thing. I think that even if the details aren't 100% factual, I remember how I felt, and I remember what it was like. So, so trying to get that into this story is the most important thing for me. If you, were, if you were describing drama to somebody, would you say it was based on your life, or would you say it's, <laughs> it's fiction? I mean, that, that, I, I had a, I, as I read it, I just assumed that it was fiction, and, but <laughs> informed by having been in theater. Yes, it's inspired by yeah. my life. I, <laughs> I really did fall in love with my gay best friend in high school, and, and his twin brother was one of my best friends, too. So, like, the characters, they come from a real place, and they're, they're inspired by real people, who I then had to be like, is it cool if I publish this? It's sort of like our life story, but not really. Because that this was is thing like I wanted to ask you about. Like, yeah, do you check with people. About, I do. Yeah, that's that's um, kind of you. <laughs> yeah, I, I I had to clear sisters with my sister before I was willing to publish it, and if she didn't feel okay about it, I wouldn't have published it at all. Because I mean, you could look at this book about her and be like, "Wow, she's the bad guy in this book," but well, she's she's little. I mean, it's fair it's that true. she feels the way she does. But it's I still, I she's a sensitive person, and I want to respect that. Um, do you have the feeling that? that there's something important in, the, in telling these particular stories, and here I'm thinking about drama as well, at, for like showing pot potential readers that like if they have a problem that's like this, they'll be able to get through it in the way that you did. Like is there a, a kind of, I, I mean, it, I, I don't wanna make it sound like you're trying to counsel them, but this <laughs> sort of like, 
um, I, I mean, I feel in some of the, in some moments in these books like this, almost like emotional reaching out to a potential reader, like, oh, if you have a problem like this, you should know that I made it through and that I'm okay, and here's my smiling picture at the <laughs> end of the book to tell you that I'm all right, you know? The answer is kind of yes, but I'm also trying consciously to tell it from the point of view of my child self. So I never wanted to come across like, I am Raina, the adult author, who's telling you how I felt at the time or telling you what you should be like or anything <laughs> like that. I don't want it to come across. I mean, because that like when I hear the word counseling, I think of a counselor who's yeah. somebody whose yeah, job I it is to, to lead you through an experience. But what I want for my stories to be like is as if you're hearing it from a friend. So you're you're talking to somebody who understands and who you know is willing to hear your confession about whatever the experience was. So that's that's, I guess that's sort of the way I approach things without even really thinking about it. But I, it's funny. I think if I were doing an autobio story about my junior high <laughs> life, I would have to tell it from an adult point of view so that I could Those make jerks. fun of myself. <laughs> like you were so dumb. Well, I do that like, too. Like <laughs> that's like the most that, fun thing. But, well, and it's interesting that that sort of. Like there, there are moments where you see the characters because they're junior high kids making kind of immature decisions. Oh sure, I still do. Ma I still make immature decisions. <laughs> but they're not. They're not rendered in a way that's unsympathetic. Like it's uh, like if they make an, a decision that comes from their youth or their immaturity or their like, uh, I don't know, like their inability to grasp the full emotional situation around them. You don't blame them for that. You know, you don't. You, as a reader, you're not led to think. <coughs> you know how the folly of youth. How, how <laughs> <laughs> you know? Instead, it's more like, oh, these these kids. You know, of course they don't completely understand what's going on in the hearts of the people around them because who can at yeah. the moment when it's going on? Um, I, I think I mean in the in a way. I, I mean, what can I say? I want to like compliment you. I want to <laughs> say like this is one of the things about the books that I feel like is most tender and most most like useful for readers. This feeling of like you're. You know, you can see these these kids are faced with real, you know, middle school problems or high school problems, but they're they're fumbling through them and they make it through okay in all in all cases. It's so like far, well, well, you know, I could still write you're a book. You're not ready to write that. <laughs> you're gonna write a tragedy. <laughs> uh. <laughs> um, <clears throat> do you um do you want to do a little drawing? I think that that easel yes. there is uh, is sturdy. Okay, we'll hope so. And if it's not, we'll find out together. So um, the way we want to do this is, uh, is kind of like, it's sort of like theater improv. Um, uh, Raina is uh, going to draw from your suggestions a four panel comic strip, a pretty simple one. Um, but, and what I'll do is sort of MC. So what I'll do is, uh, I guess, um, we'll, we'll ask for a little bit of help in each of the first three panels, different things that that you could, uh, that we could contribute. And I think what I'll do is just ask you to kind of call out ideas. Let's do hand raising. Or hand raising? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I'll, I will, I'll get a couple of, I'll, I'll ask a question and then I'll call on a couple of people just by pointing and we'll get a couple and Raina can choose between them, okay? So that it's not just necessarily the first thing, that the first hand that I call on. Um, so the first thing is we need, we need a character to be in the story. So like maybe suggest a profession for the character. Um, you first. A tap dancer, I like or it. a, or a turtle, <laughs> or are you, a librarian. or a librarian? So you can choose. Tap so dancer, let's do a tap dancing turtle. Oh, awesome! <laughs> okay, um, and I'm I'm gonna make Reina the second character in the story. Oh, this is gonna be difficult. So a tap dancing turtle. Um, so let's see. Tap dancers usually have like a hat in their hands, right? Like a top hat, don't they? Yeah. Okay, so let's see, some tap shoes. And I'll do a little bit of like motion lines so that it looks like there's some action going on. This kind of looks like a snail now that I realize it too. <laughs> okay, so if I wow, was- he's really going. Yeah. Oh, wait, I forgot sound effects. Tap, 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 tap. Okay, so let's see. Let's pretend he's like a busker. So he's he's got a little, another hat here. And then um, I'm just drawing this sort of like quick, easy version of myself. 
this is what I mean by thumbnails when yeah, I'm like, eh, just it's just say, like. This is very much like the thumbnail part of the process where you're figuring out, figuring out what goes on the page. And All right, um, so I'm walking say. down the street and I'm seeing a tap dancing turtle. There we go. Um, and now we need. A <laughs> and I'm just gonna put a thought balloon that goes, "Whoa." Because <laughs> what else would you say if you see a tap dancing turtle like asking for money on the street? Okay, so, so we have we have the situation. Yeah, the first step in the th in the st in telling a four panel story is situation. The second step is some kind of conflict. So we need to have maybe like a problem that arises for one or the other of the characters <laughs> or some kind of obstacle for them. Do you have ideas? Um, tell me. So uh, another tap dancer or another uh -huh. dancer and dancing animal maybe competing with the turtle. Uh, what was your idea? The turtle loses his hat. The turtle loses his hat. <laughs> That's nice because <laughs> it's generated from the stuff of the first panel. Um, another idea here. Yeah. A breakdancing rabbit. A break rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, those those two things are really similar. So another dancing animal slash a breakdancing rabbit. Yeah, maybe you should have. So a um. Okay. This could just be like farther down the street. Right. That's right. So we're we're gonna do that. We're gonna do. Exactly. <laughs> These things just write themselves. It's pretty great. Oh, good. Yeah. In order for it to really feel like not just further, not just one more panel, but also conflict, she's still got the tap dancing turtle there noticing what's going on. This is that was smart. I th I'm doing like the play-by-play -play announcing as if we were doing <laughs> like the commentator on ESPN or something. Oh man, that is good. That's good break dancing. There's right got to be the little yeah. piece of cardboard yeah, down here cardboard. that they. Um, okay, so so I'm thinking now, like you know, she hasn't given any money to the turtle yet. So maybe what's going to happen here is that she's like, oh, I know where I want to give my money, and it is not to a tap dancing turtle. Oh, I forgot the boom box. Important. <laughs> I didn't leave space for the tape deck in the center, but you can imagine. Okay, so noise and music and stuff, and then some excitement to follow. Maybe I should put a dollar in her hand over here so that we know that there's money at stake. This is, this is another clever thing to pay attention to when you're learning to draw comics. Like you wanna have things that, things that bridge the gap from one panel to another. So like if you if you want to think about the character giving money like you want to put that money not just in the panel where the decisions being made but also earlier on so that the reader can see the see continuity moving from one panel to the next. Lots of motion lines. Okay. So okay. we've got a breakdancing rabbit a little further down the sidewalk. And if the first step is set up and the second set up second, second step is conflict, then the third panel needs to have a twist like something to make the conflict uh, a little different from what you expected it to be in the first something place. Something nobody would see coming. Something this nobody is where sees it's coming. the most fun for you guys, is to like throw me a wild card. In the back, way, way in the back, what is your idea? <laughs> okay, so the money goes to maybe a different animal. What is your idea? <laughs> <laughs> the turtle starts breakdancing. <laughs> uh, yeah, tell me your idea. Oh, well, uh -huh, that's a good. Okay. That's a good last that panel, panel, actually. Oh God, um, let's let's go with the breakdancing turtle because that sounds like the most fun to draw. You um, could probably do really good, like those those back spins that they <laughs> once they get. They All right, so let's have the rabbit in the foreground, realizing he's about to be upstaged by um, breakdancing turtle. <laughs> and then he's still gonna have his hat in his hand. Tap dancing turtle now with top hat. 
So let's see. Just draw that spinning. Yeah, there you go. Spin lines. Spinning. <laughs> There's still a boom box playing. This is another one of those continuity. moments of continuity That's from important. panel to panel. <laughs> <coughs> Drawing in perspective um, on an easel <laughs> really quickly in front it of looks, people. It's plausible. It's pl okay, there we go. So let's see. I guess the the conflict here really rests in young Reina, who is like, hmm, how am I going to decide who to give my dollar to? And of course, I get to make up the resolution here. Yeah, if the, first, if the first step is set up and the second one is conflict, introducing the conflict, the third is some twist, and the fourth panel has to be resolution because that's the last panel you get in a four panel strip. All right, so we've got her going, hmm, what am I gonna do? And I forgot to draw the little musical notes and the, the booming of the box. All right. Um, Okay, I think I have it figured out, so I'm okay. just gonna draw the resolution without talking about it. And you guys can just enjoy it as it. I see a smiling Reyna. <laughs> oh, I forgot the little lines on the rabbits. Bandana. Yes. <laughs> they do not look too happy. And the turtle are unhappy. I'm not very good at drawing turtles today. I know it's go. not a very satisfying right. ending, but what would you do if you had to choose between two breakdancing turtles and rabbits? Come on. Can we have a water track or anything? Oh, yeah. I have my own small plane upstairs. Yeah, we should. Okay, so. So we have, I think, a few minutes. I actually need to double check. We have about 10 minutes. Yeah, we have about yeah. 10 minutes. So we could probably take a couple of questions, at least, from, from you guys, if you have them. Um, yeah, you first. Probably the same thing. Just, I mean, I've been writing in a diary since I was 10, and I think that helped me to sort of find my voice as somebody who tells personal stories. But I also really liked creative writing when I was in school. So it was just the class that I looked forward to the most and put the most effort into my homework and stuff. And for a long time, I thought, well, I'm really okay at drawing comics, but I'm not very good at writing them, so I'll just draw comics. And when I illustrated the Babysitter's Club series, it was really fun, but and Martin's uh, stories were like, and then there's a dog, and then there's a car, and then there's like a big valise. And I was like, oh man, if I want to tell other people's stories, I'm going to have to draw the kinds of things they want to talk about. So I better start and writing cars my own. Cars are not the funnest thing. No, to draw. they're not. Although now I don't mind drawing cars so much. But um, if I realized if I wanted to tell the stories that I wanted to tell, I would have to write them too. And I still feel like I have lots and lots of work ahead of me to become a good writer. But um, the only thing you can do is practice. You know, it was interesting to see in your in your description of your process in the slideshow that it, the writing and drawing begin simultaneously yeah, I can't, in the thumbnails. I there's can't not sit like down with like a computer and write. It just yeah, doesn't work for me. Yeah, there's not a script me. beforehand. So mm -hmm. actually, the 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 like the process of learning to draw comics is both a drawing and a writing process. It's hard to separate them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Spoilers. <laughs> oh, I didn't even know there was a new there, book. There's a, well, it's not out yet. Yeah. I mean, my, my new book just came out like a week ago. So when people are like, what's next? I'm like, sisters. Oh, it's out. Shoot, I better write another book now. Um, I have a contract for a book. I have an outline for that book, but I don't have the book written. It does have a ghost in it, and that's really all I can tell you right now. So, yeah. It'll probably be out in like two or three years. <laughs> My son will be totally into it. He's, he really likes ghosts right now. I guess it won't be out right now. No. I bet he'll still like ghosts. <laughs> Not even close. Um, 
Yes. We can, we can come back. It's okay. Yeah, we'll come back. Um, in the back there. I wasn't shocked, but I would say I was disappointed. And it's all coming from people that haven't read the story. So they say, oh, there's a gay character in this book. Now I'm going to throw it in the garbage. And I'm like, it's about a gay character who's like best friends with the main character and how she learns that he's gay and like is a little surprised at first, but she goes, wait, he's just like anybody else. He's my friend. And so it's about friendship and it's about, you know, being able to be friends with lots of different kinds of people. And I think there's no, there's nothing wrong with the message in that book, but people that are homophobic don't care what the message is. They just care about the aspect that the message is about. I don't know, it's really, it's tricky to talk about because I come from San Francisco where you know, there's just one big rainbow out there and it's awesome. <laughs> I mean, DC is a great place too. It's like, I, I've always lived in cities and I've always been surrounded by really liberal cultures. Um, so when people are from places that are a little bit less liberal, I'm always a little surprised. Like, like yeah, like, oh, it's 50 years in the past somewhere else. That's too bad. <laughs> but, um, you know, and, yeah, I could I could talk about this for a long time. And I, it might be better if you want to, like, chat with me at my table later. But <laughs> I'll tell you all the anecdotes later. Um, yeah, those Amazon reviews are only awesome when my friends find out about them and then argue with them in the comments. <laughs> Not that I encourage that sort of thing, but it's, it's kind of fun to see. Um, yeah, go ahead. Hmm. Well, in Smile, she's a very minor character, but people paid attention to her right away and were like, oh, what's the deal with your sister? What's she, what's she like in real per in life? And so people just wanted to know more about her. And because she spent so much time with me growing up and we're such different personalities, it seems like those are the tools of storytelling as you put two characters that don't have a lot in common in a room together and then see what happens. So I realized, like, these are the tools are right in front of me and I have lots of anecdotes to tell. So I just decided that I would focus on her for my book. Um, and yeah, I think sister dynamics are really interesting. Uh, we have probably time for two quick questions two or one substantial questions. one. So we'll see. Uh, um, uh, you there in the, in the, yeah, go ahead, you, and then I'll get, there's a woman behind you that I'll call on too, but go ahead. <laughs> Depends on how you define fine. <laughs> yeah, he's awesome. <laughs> I'm going to say no more. <laughs> I'll write a book about him sometime. <laughs> um, and, in, and just behind him, a couple of people back, yeah. Do you like to draw? Good start. Um, do you like to write? Also a good start. Keep doing those two things. Um, share them with people. Put them up on the internet. Publish your work. Um, take any opportunity that comes your way and, and be really nice to people. Because if you're a jerk, people are going to remember that way before they remember how nice you were. <laughs> do we have time for one more yeah, quick question? Yeah, we probably have just time one? for just one more. You okay. there, yeah. Well, my audience will age, but the cool thing about kids is that there's always more of them. <laughs> People keep having kids. It's pretty cool, actually, how that works, but um, I don't know. I, I tried to write drama a little bit older. I tried to make it about high school kids, and my editors were like, nope, your audience is middle grade, so you should probably do, at least for now. So it's possible that I will write books for an older audience at some point, but I won't be able to be published by Scholastic because they're a kid's publisher. Um, and right now, it's just where my heart is. I really like writing for kids. I like working with kids. I like talking to kids. I don't have any kids of my own, so I feel like I have like thousands of kids because I get to hang out with them so much. Um, and I, 
I've always felt like that's what I want to read. I want to read cool stories about real kids who are, you know, in middle school or whatever. And there's not that many comics that fall into that category. And in fact, when people are like, what else is like Smile? I'm like, there's not a very big list. Um, and everything's a little, like, it's either too old or it's like there's a fantasy component or whatever. So I'm really happy that I get to do what I do. And I'm happy when other people do what I do, too, so that I can recommend their books. Um, I feel like I'm rambling, but for now, I'm good with writing for kids, definitely. Well, we should probably wrap up so that we can be out of the room in time for the next uh, panel to start, but I, I hope you guys will join me in thanking Raina for talking Thanks, with you Isaac. Guys. Thanks.